Stephen Butterworth was a British physicist and first-rate mathematician. He was known for solving problems that others had regarded as insoluble. He invented the filter that bears his name. The poles of a Butterworth filter lie on the unit circle on the imaginary plane. But you don't need to remember or understand the imaginary plane, Laplace transforms, or big ugly polynomials to design a Butterworth lumped element filter. Mr. Butterworth has done all the heavy lifting for us. Consider the following to be a crash course in Butterworth lumped filter design. You will be designing bandpass filters for frequency multipliers in a matter of minutes. If this is old hat for you, feel free to skip ahead. Here is the general transfer function for the maximally flat Butterworth low-pass filter as a function of angular frequency omega. Omega sub c is the cutoff frequency in radians per second, and n is the filter order number. Several times in the previous presentations, we convert voltage-type functions into power by squaring the value of the function. This is no exception. Squaring it, of course, eliminates the radical. Here it's represented in decibels. Here is a plot of the low-pass filter power response in decibels normalized to an omega c of 1. I have plotted filter orders 1 through 10. Notice the slope gets steeper as the order increases. It should be noted at this point while our goal is to design bandpass filters, the low-pass model is the building block or prototype starting point. The slope of the roll-off is 20 times the order n in dB per decade. For example, here's the order 1 at 20 dB per decade and order 5 at 100 dB per decade. One expression used in the textbooks on this topic is the power loss ratio. It's simply the inverse of the power transfer function. One of the first things we usually do is determine the number of poles required for the filter, or the filter order number. This is where the expression for power loss ratio comes in handy. Here it is in decibels. We take the antilog and rearrange a few things. Take the log of both sides, this makes it easy to move the two in in front of the log. This gives us a nice equation to calculate the order required of our filter. Let's say we have a requirement of a center frequency of 200 megahertz, and we want 30 dB of attenuation at 400 megahertz. What order filter do we need? N equals the log of 10 to the 30 over 10 minus 1 divided by 2 times the log of 400 over 200. This gives us the log of 999 over the log of 2, which equals 2.999 divided by 0 0.602, equals 4.98. We then round up to the next integer order. A Butterworth filter can be designed using a table. These are the Butterworth coefficients for the inductor and capacitor values used in the filter design. You can either look up a table like this one or generate your own using this equation. That's what I use to generate this Excel table. These are called element values because they numerically represent the values of the filter component elements. These values are normalized. The source impedance is G sub zero and is normalized to one ohm. G0 is not usually shown in the tables, but is always assumed to be 1. The cutoff frequency, omega c, is normalized to radians per second, or 2 pi f, which is 0.159 hertz. The cutoff frequency is where the theoretical attenuation is 3 dB. The filter order, or number of elements, is the integer in the left column. The filter element coefficients or g sub n. Notice the element number, one greater than the filter order n, is always 1. This represents the load impedance normalized to 1 ohm. 
Sometimes it's not included in the table. Note here for a fourth order filter, the filter elements values for inductors and capacitors are G1 through G4. G5 is a load impedance normalized to 1 ohm. Notice the middle element of all odd orders is 2. Also note there is a natural symmetry across the element values. Notice on this fifth order row, 2.0 is in the middle at G3. G2 and G4 on either side of it are 1.618. Also G1 and G5 are 0 0.618. For the fourth order values, the two in the center at G2 and G3 are the same at 1.8478. You will see that pattern repeated for all other even order coefficients. These are called prototype filters because it's a template of non-dimensionalized values. Filters are required to operate at many different frequencies, impedances, and bandlets. The utility of a prototype filter comes from the property that all of these other filters can be derived from it by applying a scale factor to the components of the prototype. The filter design needs to only be carried out once in full, and the other filters being obtained by simply applying a scaling factor. This is why I said Mr. Butterworth did all the heavy lifting for us. Let's proceed with designing Butterworth filters by denormalizing to the desired frequency and impedance. Let's start with a simple low-pass filter topology. It is a series inductor and a shunt capacitor. This is the denormalization equation for the inductor. G sub i is the ith element from the table. First element of the filter will use G sub 1 and so forth. The impedance is scaled from the normalized 1 ohm up to the desired impedance R0. The element value is denormalized to the desired frequency by dividing the element value by omega C, the cutoff frequency in radians. As I mentioned, omega c is the 3 dB point of the transfer function. For the shunt capacitor, the difference is the element value is divided by R0. Since the reactance of an inductor is proportional to the inductance, the element values are multiplied by the scaled impedance. Conversely, since the reactance of a capacitor is inversely proportional to the capacitance, the element values are divided by the scaled impedance. The high pass filter is obviously the opposite topology with a series capacitor and shunt inductor. The difference here is the G sub i values are not in the numerator but are in the denominator. Here are some denormalization tips that can serve as mnemonics. Omega c is always in the denominator. R0 is always in the numerator for inductors, and R0 is always in the denominator for capacitors. Let's have some fun and design our first lumped element Butterworth low pass filter. Here's the topology for a fifth order low pass filter with the series element first. The input of the filter could have been a shunt capacitor instead of a series inductor. I just arbitrarily chose it this way. Here's the most important part to pay attention to, the reference designators. I've always had an affinity for electronic schematic diagrams. Signal flow from left to right, positive voltages on top and more negative voltages on the bottom, and reference designator number order from left to right, then top to bottom, just like reading. Here is a way to keep the filter element coefficient number associated with the right component. Here is L1, the first element of the filter. Here is the shunt capacitor, which would normally be labeled C1, but here it is named C2, since it's associated as the second element of the filter. The second inductor would normally be L2, but we make it L3 to correspond with the third element coefficient. C4 and L5 were labeled in the same manner. It's a good idea to check that each inductor and capacitor 
has a unique reference designator number and are sequential in the filter topology lineup. Each L and C contribute as one pole to the circuit. Since there are three inductors and two capacitors, that's five poles. Here are the parameters for the filter design. The cutoff frequency is 200 MHz. In the earlier example, we determined that with the 200 MHz cutoff frequency, to achieve 30 dB of attenuation at 400 MHz, we needed a 5-pole or 5th order filter. The impedance will be scaled to a 50 ohm system, so the source impedance and load impedance is 50 ohms. Here's the row of coefficients table for n equals 5, and here's the denormalization equation for low pass inductors that we will use. L1 equals the G1 value from the table 0.618 times R0 of 50 divided by omega C as 2 times pi times 200 e to the sixth equals 24.59 nanohenry. L3 equals the G3 value from the table, which is 2 times R0, which is 50, divided again by 2 pi times 200 e to the sixth equals 79.58 nanohenry. Since G5 is the same as G1, L5 equals L1 at 24.59 nanohenry. Bringing over the equation to denormalize the capacitors, C2 equals G2 from the table, which is 1.618, divided by 2 times pi times 200 e to the sixth, times 50, equals 25.75 picofarad. Since G4 equals G2, C4 will equal C2, and that's all there is to it. Here's the design filter response. See the cutoff frequency or 3 dB point at 200 MHz. The attenuation of 30 dB at 400 MHz was barely achieved. Remember the calculated order was 4.98, and we rounded to the fifth order. In the real world, you would probably need more margin. Now let's move on to bandpass filters. The bandwidth of the low-pass prototype was from DC to the 3 dB cutoff point. When transforming to the bandpass configuration, the bandwidth doesn't double, as in the function being mirrored. It remains the same bandwidth as the low-pass prototype. This figure is not often found in textbooks, but I believe it's a fundamental concept. This introduces delta, which is the upper cutoff frequency omega-2 minus the lower cutoff frequency omega-1 divided by the center frequency omega-0. Let's suppose we had a 8 MHz bandwidth filter at 375 MHz. This would be a delta of 0.021, or 2.1%. Here's a normalized plot of a bandpass filter with a 20% bandwidth, or delta of 0.2. This was plotted by the same power loss ratio equation we used earlier, except the frequency offset is multiplied by 2. However, the center frequency omega sub 0 is the geometric mean of omega-1 and omega-2. For narrowband filters, there is a negligible difference between omega-0 being the arithmetic mean versus the geometric mean. Some denormalization equations use upper and lower frequencies versus the delta, but delta is easier to work with. If you wanted to get exact, I derived these equations using a quadratic to return omega-1 or omega-2 from the center frequency and delta. On the left, for reference, are the low-pass and high-pass topologies and their associated denormalization equations. Here is the topology of the bandpass filter. Delta is now in all the denormalization equations, and I highlighted it in red to stand out. It's very much like a low-pass and high-pass blended together and the denormalization equations should make that even more clear.
for the low pass, the series inductor was G sub I times the impedance R0 over omega C. The series inductor for the bandpass is the same, but the delta is in the denominator. The shunt capacitor in the low pass has the same denormalization with delta also in the denominator. The high pass series capacitor denormalization is the same as the band pass, with delta in the numerator. The shunt inductor in the high pass is like the shunt inductor of the band pass, with delta also in the numerator. Here are a couple tips for band pass denormalizing equations. Low pass equivalent components in band pass have delta in the denominator. High pass equivalent components in band pass have delta in the numerator. The last round of the crash course is to design a Butterworth bandpass filter. Here is the topology for a third order bandpass filter with the series elements first. Again, the input of the filter could have been a shunt pair instead of a series pair. It was just an arbitrary choice. Again, I stress how important it is to pay attention to the reference designators. The way we do it with bandpass is different, but the discipline is still as effective. The bandpass filter sections are LC pairs. Here is L1, the first element of the filter. Here is the series capacitor. Since it's paired with the input series inductor, it needs to be named C1, as it will use the same Butterworth coefficient as L1. The first shunt inductor will be L2, and its paired shunt capacitor will also be a 2. The third LC in series at the output will bear the number 3. Here are the parameters for the filter design. The center frequency is 375 MHz. It will be a 3-pole or third-order filter. The bandwidth will be 2%, which is 7.5 MHz. The impedance will be scaled to a 50 ohm system, so the source impedance and load impedance is 50 ohms. Here's the row in the coefficients table for n equals 3. And here is that denormalization equation for series inductors that we will use. L1 equals G1 from the table, which is 1 times R0 of 50. Divided by omega C as 2 times pi times 375 e to the 6 times the bandwidth of 0.02 equals 1.06 microhenry. L3 is also in series, and it turns out the coefficient for element 3 is also 1. So L3 equals L1. While we are doing inductors, let's bring in the denormalization equation for the shunt inductor. L2 equals 50 times 0.02 divided by 2 times pi times 375 e to the 6 times 2 which equals 212 picohenry. Let's bring in the equation for the series capacitor. C1 equals 0.02 divided by 2 times pi times 375 to the E6 times 1 times 50 equals 0.17 picofarad. C3 is also in series, and the coefficient for the element 3 is also 1, so C3 equals C1. Lastly, the equation for the shunt capacitor, C2 equals the G2 coefficient 2, divided by 2 times pi times 375e to the 6th times 50 times 0.02 equals 848 picofarad. This is a fun theoretical exercise, but some problems exist. Look at the value of L2. I doubt you can buy an inductor that low, and the interconnect inductance would also impact the total inductance of the circuit. Also, look at C1 and C3. These are very low values and would also be thrown off by parasitics. Let's look at the denormalization equations again. 
Where we get into trouble is when the bandwidth delta is small and in the numerator. As delta goes down, the element values go down. As omega naught, the center frequency, goes up, this also brings the element values down. I think this helps to explain one way in which the lumped element filters are limited in frequency and bandwidth. Let's try this again with a wider bandwidth. We will keep the same parameters but increase the bandwidth from 2% to 16%, quickly calculating the new element values. To notice the improvement in attaining more reasonable and achievable components. We now have L2 at 1.7 nanohenry and C1 and C3 at 1.36 picofarad. This is significantly more practical and producible. Thanks for watching. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming content.